Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Really excited to still be on site at in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are still at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And we are gonna be talking about all things open learning, all things RFID, sensors, automation, the future of work, uh, digital learning, university design, so much. We have the honor of sitting down with Dr. Sanjay Sarma. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. It's a great, great pleasure. Great Greatly pleasure. appreciate it. And huge shout out to Woody Flowers for introducing us. Oh, he's us. such a wonderful man. Yes. And mentor. And mentor, totally, totally. Big shout out to First Robotics. And Sanjay, your background is so interesting. Okay, so he's a, if you're Fred and Daniel Fort Flowers, professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. He co-founded the Auto ID Center at MIT. He's the Vice President for Open Learning at MIT, which includes the Office of Digital Learning, MIT's Integrated Learning Initiative, and the Abdul Latif Jamil World Education Lab. He's on the board of edX as well, which is a nonprofit company that delivers MOOC, founded by Harvard and MIT. So, holy cow, uh, the amount of, of being at the cutting edge of how people learn in the world is just, is, you're right there, you're right there. And you guys here, you have a 150 person open learning floor here. And how are we gonna educate the next generation of kids into our world? This is what a lot of what you guys do as well as at the adult level. So let's, um, let's, start, with, let's start with, you know, who you are and how you got here because I, I, think, I think a lot of times um, we don't really see the full big history picture of things and you are right there on the civilizational evolution scale of things because the way you speak, you speak about these architectures changing that we had transit shifts with cars and planes and that helped with moving around. We have the internet and cell phone shift. We have this artificial intelligence shift that are coming and I love that big history perspective. So tell us about how you got that awareness shift for yourself and got interested in doing this. Doing the open learning stuff? Yeah, all the yeah, way Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I'm an engineer and what engineers do, we see an opportunity, we exploit it, right? And so that's what I did with uh, RFID and other fields, Internet of Things, etc. Uh, but as, uh, as a student, I always felt that my experience was very passive, but I learned when I was active. I learned when I was designing things. So if, if I was designing something and I needed thermodynamics, I really understood thermodynamics. But if I was sitting here passively and someone is telling me about thermodynamics, the absorption wasn't great. The mind is active, you learn. The mind's just listening mode, it fills up very quickly, you know? So uh, I uh, had a be in my bonnet about it. And uh, coming to MIT was great because now I was in the invention mode, research mode, and you know, I f this was really great for me. So when the opportunity came to help MIT in the setting up of a new university in Singapore, um, I got involved with that. And uh, one, our former dean became the president. I led the MIT team, and I really got into learning that way. And then I began to see the opportunities. And that was a, you know, in the 2010 timeframe. Um, and it bec you know, we st MIT started thinking about uh, online education using things like MIT X, edX, et cetera, et cetera. And I got bitten by the bug. And there I was, you know. So when the president asked me to do, take over the whole digital enterprise from a learning perspective, it was, uh, there was no way I could not do it. I love how you illustrate the difference between reading and learning from like, a textbook versus this necessity or curious curiosity, this drive to learn experientially. There's, there's a big difference in the way that we retain and actually get our awareness expanded through that. And also, I'm glad that, that the MIT's taken this major initiative in digital learning across the world now and that you're spearheading that. Now, how does how does this transition, because you also um, have authored a book about this as well, we're kind of transitioning in a way of, of, of seeing things that is no longer trying to maybe uh, do some barely incremental changes, fit a product into something that customers want. You're, we're talking like a major shift in with the way that we uh, rebuild um, technologies and products and, and, and services that fill uh, the way that civilization is sort of evolving. Tell us a, a bit about your framework for seeing the world in that in that way. Yeah, I'm writing a book. Uh, I haven't finished it yet but, um, with, with a colleague. But the, uh, the thing about uh, 
you know, this is a very magical time in, in the history of humankind. Um, technology has become so powerful that imagine the imagination is the limit. It's not the technology anymore, right? And um, if you look at, for example, something like a cell phone, a smartphone, I remember about uh, 30 years ago, I was just my wife and I, then girlfriend, we were trying to meet somewhere. And then I, we had to say, I will meet you at Trafalgar Square, Square at 10 a.m. in London on that date. And we both had to show up. That was the only way you could meet. And if you didn't show up, there was no recourse. Yeah. And now we take it for granted that we have smartphones and everything's changed. Our payments have changed. The way we order a taxi has changed. Everything's changed. So this is true of a number of things around us. It's crept up on us, but it's transformational. And education has to go through that. And sometimes I will make the argument, it is easier to make a bigger change than a smaller change. Interesting. Right? So it's almost easier to just rethink it and re do it, change it completely, yes. than to go halfway because you're neither here nor there. You, you want to be beyond the tipping point. Kind of like as we see technology sometimes being leapfrogged. Yeah. Like we don't need a home phone network anymore in That's the right. developing place. We jump straight to the cell phone. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in India, and you know, it was very hard to get a land telephone line. And now everyone has a smartphone, and no one had, you know, there a lot of people never had a land landline. Their families never had a landline. Yeah. And they went straight to smartphones, right? So, we, so it's almost like you need to sort of see a vision and just go there and not, not even care about the waypoints in between. So what's happening is that because of all the tectonic changes in our, in our society, right, the gig economy, it's you know, people freelancing, people working remotely, people working multiple jobs, people having to transition from one job to another, technology's half-lives have changed. If you know mm. technology today, yeah. uh, for example, the technology you're using to shoot the video here, yeah. in three years, it's gonna be completely different. Yeah. We have to constantly learn. Learning isn't something you do for four years and you're out. You, you are going to be in a learning state of mind forever. Yeah. It's like you're on a treadmill, the treadmill's moving backwards. So if you're not running forward, yeah. you're gonna fall off. Yeah. That means, and that can happen on campus. It's gonna happen online. It's gonna happen with video and audio and podcasts and maybe virtual reality, who knows? But that's how it's gonna happen. Yeah. So you might as well embrace the future, go there and have the rest follow. This, this way of seeing lifelong learning being on a treadmill is so good because we see so often that the more that we invest our time into the cutting edge of knowledge over and over again, we have the conscious choice every day when we come home. Am I going to watch something that's just going to distract me or am I going to watch one of the world leaders in their field give a talk? Yeah. Yep. And if we continue down that path, we keep educating ourselves at the edge and that just takes us to a newer and newer level of abstract thinking and creativity around where things are going and how we can stay at the front. I like that a lot. Now, I, I, and I really appreciate your big picture understanding of the evolution of technology in the world. So, okay, so now tell us about the, um, the radio frequency identification, RFID. This is super interesting how you had a, a way of, uh, of pioneering that technology and now that's exploding into IoT. So yeah, tell, tell us about this. You know, about uh, 20 years ago, a group of us, uh, me, a gentleman by the name of Kevin Ashton, David Brock, um, Sonny Sue, there were a whole bunch of us, three or four of us. We started this thing called the Auto ID Center and we had the crazy idea um, of replacing barcodes effectively with radio frequency ID. And you know, you've all seen RFID. RFID, you use it in t a toll pass as RFID. Mm -hmm. And the problem is RFID ta tags at that time used to cost to like 20, and still do. If you buy a toll pass, you know, those plastic mm -hmm. uh, little uh, little uh, rectangular boxes, they cost about 20 bucks, 15 bucks, something like that. And we had the crazy idea that if we rethought it fundamentally, there would become a few cents. And that's what's come to pass now. And so to do that, we had to pull together a technology roadmap, rethink the way the technology worked. We had to anticipate the cloud. The cloud didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to anticipate the cloud. I would point at the sky, and I didn't have the word cloud, so I'd say the sky, the internet, <laughs> you know. And we put together a bunch of protocols with about 100 really amazing companies. Large companies oh. like Walmart and J&J &J and Tesco and Procter and & Gamble 
and tiny companies. Some of them didn't survive, but many of them are successful startups and successful big companies now, right? And we put together a movement. Uh, it became a new standard. There were prototypes. There were industry uh, adoption uh, sort of efforts, uh, pilots. And now, you know, if you go to a Lauren Taylor's, a Macy's, a Decathlon, a Zara, you're going to see these RFID tags being used everywhere. It's called the electronic product code. And what it did was very simple. The fact of the matter is the supply chain, you know, whether it's manufacturing in a faraway country or sales in a retail store. Today, or before RFID, you had very little idea of the inventory. Yeah. Where are those clothes? Do I have the right size of jeans out there? And suddenly now, those things could tell you. Yeah. And now your inventory is automated. And that changes the yeah. effectiveness of the supply chain. And that's how it took off. And there were probably about 10 billion RFID techs last year. Whoa. How did you guys get the cost down from 15 or 20 bucks to a couple of cents? It's very interesting. Um, this is, again, it's a, one of those tipping point things. RFID was caught in a sort of a paradigm lock, which was they were doing too much. So RFID tags, um, they would write data into the tag, and so you needed memory. Oh. Right? If you needed to write data into the tag, it needed more power. Uh, regular RFID, the stuff we do, is passive. It has no battery. So it actually scavenges power from the reader. Right? So, uh, but then if it needs a lot of power, you can't go very far. So what we said was, listen, the internet's taking off. So just put a unique number on the tag, license plate, and put all the data on the network. And people thought we were crazy because they didn't believe the internet was taking off. 1998, people didn't even know what the internet was. But we made that bet. N and then we just focused on simplifying the tag and the protocol, making the protocol really efficient. Again, there were lots of companies involved, yes. lots of amazing capital from amazing people from all these companies, and of course, the MIT crew, University of uh, Cambridge in the UK, University of Adelaide, Fudan University in China, and ETH Zurich. Those are the uh, universities we brought oh. into the loop, and we all worked together. And once we went to this new world, where the data would be in the sky, because I couldn't say cloud, because I didn't know <laughs> the, didn't, the word didn't exist, and you could uh, make the tags cheap, very tiny, tiny. Uh, and low power, it just took off. And then, yeah. once the paradigm set in, the industry took off. Interesting, and they could be that small because they would scavenge the power from the source that's aiming to scan it? it they could, well, the, the tag consists of a chip and an antenna. Mm -hmm. Right, the antenna is bigger, but you can put it in the packaging, for example. Yeah, yeah. The chip itself is about uh, one third of a millimeter. Whoa. And because the chip is small, it needs very little power. Yeah. It turns out, uh, not to get too technical, that if you put a lot of functionality on the chip and the chip becomes big, it needs more power. Power. Yeah. Whoa, so 10 billion RFIDs. At least. Yeah. At least. Yeah. And, and it's everywhere in the supply chain because it makes r inventory so much easier. And this is actually a big deal with, uh, with the way that we're advancing blockchain protocols is we care a lot about making sure that it's a trust-based thing as well. We want to make sure That's that right. these, that the right, um, um, item is being processed and we're following it along the track. But well, also, by the way, toll passes those irritating big rectangular plastic boxes, they're going to be re replaced with our standard soon. So. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, now the Auto ID Lab is exploding into IoT as well. So teach us about what's going on um, with the Auto ID Lab size, who the, what kind of a composition of like engineer scientists there are there, and then what's going on with IoT transition. <coughs> yeah, so the term IoT was actually coined by one of the co-founders of the Auto ID Lab, uh, Kevin Ashton. Um, and what he said was, you know, uh, what we were all saying at that time was, everything's going to be connected to the internet. Yeah. I would point at a clock and say, someday that'll be connected to the internet. People thought I was crazy. Yeah. But that's basically what my Apple Watch is. Right? Yeah. So, and so that term, IoT, which Kevin came up with, has really captured the zeitgeist. In 2005 time frame, it started taking off. We wrote a paper uh, in, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, called The Networked Physical World, which sort of talked about it. Now, IoT is very interesting. So why do we connect things to the internet? Because you can do amazing things with it. So for example, if I have a camera outside my home, and my lock is on, is connect is connected to the internet. I can see if the nanny has shown up. 
and unlock the door if she couldn't get in, yeah. right? Yeah. If my car is connected to the internet, which it is, I can take delivery of a package into the trunk. Very interesting. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's game changing. If I have a factory in some faraway country and I want to see what the quality situation is, I can monitor, monitor it remotely. Interesting. If there's a fire in a building, I can remotely activate the fire uh, fighting equipment in a way that optimizes the firefighting as opposed to today, which is, you know, it's not really planned, right? I can have robots going. So it is a game changer. And so what we do in the Auto ID Lab uh, is uh, we do, of course, RFID research, but we have, it's an amazing group of uh, PhDs, uh, PhD students, um, master's students, undergrads, and, and then a whole wise. bunch of companies. About it's about 15 people in the lab and, okay. you know, 50 people that we work with, maybe cool. 100, you know, okay. uh, around the world. Okay. And, um, and then that's just my lab, Auto ID Lab. But then there's another Auto ID Lab from uh, the Auto ID Center days in Etaha, ET at Zurich, there's one in the Disney of Cambridge, and so on. So cool. if you add it all up, it's probably about 100 people. Nice. And together, we take on these big problems yeah. of what is the future of the Internet of Things. How do autonomous cars, how will they talk to stop signs? Yeah. Right, that's IoT. And questions emerge, like security. What if someone hacks the... Interesting, it's likely that we'll have an IoT device inside the stop sign rather Absolutely. than rely on the camera of the vehicle. Yeah. Look, how, look how crazy it is, right? Um, it's a higher efficacy to have the IoT sense. And it's safer. Look, yeah. think about it. In the 21st century, I have a self-driving Tesla. I come, up to a stop, I come up to a traffic light. The Tesla looks at three circles and says, one of them I think is red, so I'm going to stop. Is that how it should work? Or should, it, should the light say, dude, you better stop because I'm red right now. Yes. And even worse, you can spoof the light. So there's a cybersecurity problem. problem so this exactly. you need to put cryptography in. So IoT is going to pervade everything, everything that you. Whoa. Whoa. <clears throat> yeah, you're thinking about these things well in advance. That's so, that's so interesting. So, so IoT inside of every stoplight and also a, a, a cryptographic secure signal that occurs between them to prevent cyber attacks. Very interesting. And it's you, inevitable. It's inevitable. We have to do this. Yeah. And we're, this wow. is what my lab does, um, among other things. Uh, yeah. We, in, and then in order to power all of these, uh, yeah, how are we going to have everything, everything in, a, in a factory, all the IoT sensors in a factory, all the IoT sensors on the traffic lights, et cetera? How does that all get powered? Is that part yeah. of the 5G network? Or That's a great what? question. There are two aspects to it. Uh, one is how do you network, and that's where 5G comes in. Okay. Okay, and one of the aspects of 5G is low latency. Yeah. Why? Because if I'm coming up to a, tra tra a traffic sign, I need to know instantaneously I need to stop. It, it can sort of, you know, have the the hourglass and I'm waiting because the car is going to drive through the uh, traffic uh, crossing, right? So that's why latency is very important. 5G will play a big part. But the other is where does the actual power come from? And that'll be a combination. If you can wire it, it'll be wired. But for backup and for, and for places that you can't wire, mm -hmm. it'll be scavenging. It'll be RF scavenging. It'll be solar scavenging. There might be a little battery, but to store only between scavenging events. So one of the things we're working on, for example, is building photovoltaics into, into IoT. That's but cool. Some yeah. people are working on vibrational scavenging. Others are working on RF scavenging. So, so this essentially would work as a massive network of, like the way that trees share resources all yeah. underground is that um, if the ground battery, if the normal grounded battery fails, then you can rely on a photovoltaic. And if, and if that one has a lot of energy, the other one doesn't, they can potentially pass along that energy. Wow. Um, okay, this is, we, could, we will end up having to spend more time talking <laughs> about auto ID because this is a cool industry. Um, but I, I do want to also, of course, get to all of the cool um, open learning stuff that's going on. So let's, let's jump over to that. So, um, so teach us, this was actually really cool walking down the hall and seeing that um, MIT Open Courseware, which was started in 2001, uh, 18 years of it, you're at 
you know, 1.8 million subscribers, you have 2,500 courses, this is all free, and this isn't the, this isn't like MITx edX, which has deadlines and, and whatnot. This is totally open flows of watching videos, looking at PDF notes, et cetera. Um, so teach us about MIT Open Courseware, uh, MITx, and how that's like edX, and, um, and then, yeah, teach us, yeah, teach us about yeah, that. Yeah, sure, 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 yeah. So, you know, uh, people don't realize that the open source movement for software, uh, I, uh, MIT is probably one of the places it started, and it's an ethos at MIT, which is, let's, when we do stuff, let's make it open. Let's give knowledge away for free, right? Yeah. Um, you're raise, raising the baseline around the world for access to these really uh, uh, awareness expanding fields of uh, just access to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've, it's our mission to give knowledge and to give access. Ours too, which is none uh, none of our content is ever paywalled. This is all- That's amazing. Absolutely, that's, that's the amazing. best way to do, to do yeah, it that's and find amazing. other re ways yeah. to- And you monetize it. in other ways, right? I mean, you don't have to you monetize everything. Just yeah. give stuff for free. Yeah. lift, you know, the tide lifts everyone, and it's vice versa. We learn from others too. It's not like an MIT is giving knowledge to the world. The world gives us knowledge. We learn from other universities. We learn from uh, unknown inventors in a, you know, in a part of the world we never thought someone was being so creative with. I mean, so it's a very mutual thing. Humanity is a beautiful thing, right? Okay. So in uh, 2000, 2001, MIT started looking at uh, online education for the first time, and we said, you know what? we aren't going to make money with this. We will take our content, professor by professor, course by course, with their permission, and we'll just make it available to the world for free. And that was called MIT OpenCourseWare. And so now there are actually way more than 2,500 courses. Many have been archived. Cool. But 2,500 well, 2, courses today, where you can go to ocw.mit.edu. Links you in can, the bio. Yeah, and you can read about, I don't know, quantum mechanics or linguistics, or mathematics, or cryptography, or you know, chemistry. It's a, it's a dazzling, dazzling um, cabinet of beautiful curiosities in the space of uh, knowledge. And I'm so proud of MIT for having done that. So that was uh, almost 20 years ago. This reminds me so much of, of our content as our content also features these diverse leaders across fields. And then it gives you this multidisciplinary lens of seeing yeah. the world if you go and take these different courses, watch these different videos. Open learning, okay, continue. Yeah. Yes, so continue. That's sort of a funny thing. I was actually on Open Course for this morning. I was trying to help my daughter out with something and I'd searched and of course went to Open uh, Courseware. And once you get in, it's like, it's, it's, you're stuck, it's beautiful, you know, I read about this, I read about that, I uh, moved on to something in math, and then I did some physics, and you know, and I forgot about what I was going to help my daughter with, so it's, it's, it's great stuff. So that's how OpenCourseWay is created. The OpenCourseWay is somewhat more static, it's still, you know, material with a few, you know, and the, you know, it started getting dynamic, but in 2011, December, MIT announced to the world that it would launch a MOOCs. And so that was the creation of this thing called MITx and edX. I'll explain the two. Effectively, what happened was in, in spring of 2012, Anant Agarwal, uh, a professor at MIT, a really amazing guy, he launched uh, MIT's first MOOC. It was one of the first MOOCs in the world, actually, after a couple of other universities in Athabasca University. Then there was a MOOC from Stanford. We did this MOOC, so all around the same time. And he ended up with some, with well in excess of a hundred thousand students in his MOOC. <laughs> and <laughs> dang, whoa! Yeah, yeah. that and many people at the same time taking the course. Yeah, whoa! And so, uh, so we knew we were onto something. So MIT and Harvard created a new nonprofit entity called edX, mm -hmm. and edX is a um, edX.org. It's a destination. As you know, true to form, edX is open source. All the edX software is open source. It's been downloaded and used thousands of times by people around the world who run their own sort of mooky things. And uh, edX now has uh, more than 130 universities from around the world, um, Caltech, Dartmouth, uh, it's a McGill, um, I think, yeah, oh. University of Toronto, IIT in India, Tsinghua in China, right? So this really uh, 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 amazing set of universities, Etaha in, in my, my friends, Etaha in, uh, in Switzerland, ETH, Zurich, um, they're all members, and each of them has a production unit. So MIT has MITx, Harvard has HarvardX, mm -hmm. Caltech has CaltechX. They produce courses, 
and edX is the platform on which these courses run. So students go to edX.org and they can see this, all the courses run by all the universities and they can take them. And more recently, edX launched, uh, actually we launched and edX uh, uh, took over something called the MicroMasters, which is a new credential that we've invented. And most recently, edX also now uh, oh. offers full masters. Full masters, full accredited masters. masters. Uh, yeah. Um, digitally, digitally, free. So the uh, edX model is not free, okay. it's freemium. freemium. So in other words, you can get the content for free, okay. you pay for the certificates. And, okay. pay, and the content, you, there's, if, if, you're, if you're doing assessments and you're getting a certificate, you pay for it. But if you just want to watch the videos, that's free. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Whoa, just democratizing uh, our ability to learn and then also even to get a certificate, a credit yeah, certificate. Yeah, that's right. And the certificates, you know, we're talking about tens of dollars, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, something like that. It's not like... Dang, whoa, yeah. it's very cheap. Yeah. Compa whoa. Um, uh, as you as you were speaking about the the complexity and fr from 2012 until now, the, these last seven years of putting together the different you listed like India and China and Switzerland and then of course Harvard and MIT and, and Dartmouth and stuff, how they are all able to how you guys all work together in creating your own MOOCs that go up into the edX. This seems like a very complex endeavor, as in like. Is Harvard Harvard X's economics course slightly different than MIT yeah. X's economics course? How does yeah? How does this yeah, work? Yeah, it's uh, the best way to build complex things is to build simple things, right? Okay. So we don't talk to each other. Whoa. We produce, Interesting. We, we produce an economics course. Harvard produces an economic course. Economics course. Yeah. Our faculty are different. Whoa. Their perspectives are different. Oh, cool. Right. So okay. the, the courses have different DNA. Like just like people yeah. are similar but different. We're similar in many respects. We're different in different in That's many cool. respects. Yeah. It's it's fine. And students sometimes will take. That's I've had students cool, yeah. take the same course from two different univers universities yeah, yeah, yeah. and say they're different in the following ways. And I learned something there and I learned something here. Different yeah. perspectives. It's great. It's that diversity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, yeah, you're just um, that's a, that's also a good way to potentially figure out um, what you can learn dif the different uh, teaching styles at different yeah, uh, air parts yeah. of the world, especially if you go across the world to the um, western half Asia versus uh, eastern hemisphere, and just see what how the how it's differently being taught. Yeah. Um, Okay, as we're talking about the complexity, I want you to, to teach us about this. There's this uh, big air traffic control, uh, big bulletin in, in open learning's floor here, and you have a list of, of, of courses that, you are, uh, that you're updating or you're publishing out into the MITx part of edX. And it must be obviously very difficult to be able to, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to parse the world's knowledge to find what can best fit into your MITx course, and then you're trying to parse again to fit into this other subject matter, and then actually develop out what the best educational curriculum would be in that field. So tell us about how crazy this all yeah, is. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a little bit, um, there's sort of, uh, it's, it's something between um, wonderfully chaotic and somewhat organized, right? So what we do is um, we have the, um, the Dean for Digital Learning, um, who uh, Cr Professor Krishna Rajagopal, former chair of the faculty, um, his role within our within my organization is to go to faculty and say, hey, why don't you propose courses? And they propose courses, and then the courses come to, uh, we have a review panel, and we say, we'll produce this course, we'll produce that course, you know, 10, 15, mm -hmm. and then we produce them. Now, the beauty of that is you may get, at the same time, a linguistics course being produced an engineering course on IoT or something, okay. and a course on drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? It's fascinating. So for us, it's extraordinary learning yeah. experience. Right? Yes, and we yes. meet these amazing colleagues yeah. talking about their stuff. So that's the sort of the organized chaos part. But then the, organ the more organized part comes because sometimes uh, departments will come to us and say, I want to produce a MicroMasters in, for example, economics or in manufacturing. And and then you get a sequence of courses on the mm -hmm. same topic, yeah, but yeah. they're sort of more progressive. Cool. But yeah. to, to date, we've produced uh, so many courses that uh, there are lots of nice patterns. You can take a pathway in physics and take the four key courses in physics or in math or in, yes, yes. in philosophy. So, so the whole, the f it's sort of like, think of it this way. Imagine if I had a jigsaw puzzle of the Mona Lisa, right? And I randomly go and put the picture, the, the pieces up. Initially, be like, well, what is that? 
Even she say, you know, I see the Mona Lisa smile, the rest yeah. of the pictures in there, but I get what this is. So that's wow. what's happening. We're building cool. an online curriculum, one jigsaw piece at a time. And this is also important just to, for, to address to um, people that, you know, you're a nonprofit. Are the, the other um, uh, Harvard X and across the world, these X's that go into the edX, they're all nonprofits? Well, the way I'll say it to you is edX for sure is a nonprofit. Yes. So edX is oh, and also open source. Oh, an open source. It's yeah. also open source. Yeah. So funnily, all the great universities in the world, uh, most of them, I think pretty much all of them are nonprofits. MIT is a hard nonprofit. Mm. At X, I mean, Harvard is a nonprofit. Caltech is a nonprofit. Yeah. We're all nonprofits. Yeah, yeah. So this is a nonprofit. There's a great nonprofit universities from around the world, working with a nonprofit platform called edX. And as long as you have an internet connection, boom, go and start learning. Yeah. Uh, yep. yeah. And um, the the difference, you know, with the Coursera type, Coursera is for profit. Khan Academy is doing more high school um, level yeah. um, work. Now, and I should say we're very yes. proud of Sal Khan because he has a couple of degrees from MIT, and what he's done is extraordinary. My 16-year-old learned a lot of stuff from uh, Sal Khan. So that's high school. He does stuff that sort of bumps into college, AP, things like that, but he's really more school-oriented. Yeah. Man, the baseline is going up. It's so cool to have uh, the digital learning be free online. It, that's. Mm. Um, it's enabling the degrees of freedom for people to explore what they find most interesting more easily from professionals, from really high level from around the world. Or you could say the freedom of degrees. The freedom of degrees too, <laughs> that's good, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, teach us about the Jamil World Education Lab. Yeah, so um, we at MIT have spent a lot of time thinking about the future of education at MIT. One of the things we do with our MIT X courses is we deploy them on campus, we flip the classroom. Professors then have the opportunity to spend more time coaching their students rather than you know, one way lecturing because the lecture is now online and the student might have watched the lecture on the subway before coming into class or the pre previous evening. And so the actual classroom becomes much more active and fun and engaging yeah. and much more one-on-one. -on -one. So that's why we did this. And you know, MIT is pretty cutting edge. Our faculty are very you know, sort of forward-looking, very tech-savvy. So we are transforming ourselves very well. So there's been uh, a great deal of interest from um, universities around the world, but also even companies, governments, like national governments, and also schools, like high schools, elementary schools, middle schools, saying, yeah. how do we upgrade ourselves to the new pedagogy that our students want and their yeah. parents yeah. want because yeah. they're taking courses on Khan Academy. And they don't want to come sit in a class passively while the teacher just talks. How do we change it? So uh, due to a generous gift from a, a, a one of our uh, wonderful alumni, uh, Muhammad Jamil, we founded uh, the Jamil World Education Lab. And um, the uh, JWell, as we call it. And what it is, is an academy for academies. That's the way to think about it. Okay. A university for universities. And so what we have is a consortium f of folks interested in pre-kindergarten through grade 12 education. The pre-kindergarten is important, by the way, yeah, yeah. because kids start learning a lot the moment they're born. Yes, And yes. you've got to even figure that out. Yes. And then higher ed, which is, you know, colleges. And then also workforce education, which is, you know, country, entire countries are grappling with, you know, how will people be employed in the 21st century? Yes. Right? How will they learn? Yes. And as I said earlier, all the time. And that's going to be online. So how do you rethink workforce education? You know, the Germans have an apprenticeship system. Yes. The Swiss have an apprenticeship system. How do they fit into all this? So to examine all that, we have this uh, collaborative. It's got three consortia in the pre-kindergarten through grade 12, higher ed, and workforce training. And that's what the Jamil World Education Lab is, or as we call it affectionately, JWell. Yeah. Having the discussions about what is the best practices across all the different ages um, and best strategies, like you were describing with apprenticeships, all that stuff, because mentoring is one of the best ways to be able to learn that one-on-one. -on -one, um, Absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. That's how we we evolved to learn by mentorship because we were all children, and many of us will become parents. Yeah. Yep. And it's a wonderful form of mentorship. Yep. And even what we can't get from our family and relatives, um, we can get from uh, mentors in industry and, um, That's right. and other places. That's right. Yeah. 
So what about the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative? Yeah. We have spent a lot of time thinking about learning. You know, imagine, think of it this way. Imagine um, medicine before we had x-rays and biochemistry and genetics, right? Uh, before World War, uh, it, even b before World War II, we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, antibiotics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, forgotten when Fleming discovered penicillin, but it was I think around World War II time, a little bit yeah, after, 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 right? Yeah. yeah. So now what we have is um, a very fascinating thing in that we're understanding how the brain l learns. We're understanding where dyslexia and ADHD come from. We're understanding uh, how we forget and how important forgetting is to learning. How to stay high neuroplasticity throughout. That's like, right, yeah. that's right. But also, it's amazing. And this is leading to other breakthroughs, not just in learning. It's leading to, the, leading to things like Alzheimer's, yeah, uh, epilepsy, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, Parkinson's disease, n uh, neurodegeneration. And MIT has an extraordinary bunch of uh, brain scientists, literally brain scientists. Yes. We're also learning about the economics of learning. You know, so all these emotional debates today in politics about is are charter schools good or not? Oh, yeah. But h how about we burden the emotional debates with actual facts and data, yes. right? Yes. And there's amazing amounts of data. Yes. You know, does a lottery system work? What's the best transportation type system? Yes, yes. How should you incentivize teachers? So it's a very MIT approach. And so the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative uses science, numbers, data, economic thinking, economics, econometrics, Cool. to figure out how to reinvent education based on these fundamental discoveries about how we learn. Interesting. And what have been some of the key uh, analyses of neuroscience as well as economics? And what, what have they taught us so far? What they've taught us is surprisingly human. I was worried that when we, the discoveries would be, you know, sort of cold, you know, clinical. But actually the discoveries have been very human. One of them is that... Uh, Humans, our learning patterns make sense. We've evolved to learn just as children learn from adults. Even adults learn the same way, by the way. Right? So coaching, interpersonal mm -hmm. coaching works very well. Um, we know, for example, about the importance of things like forgetting. Yeah. We know, for example, how dyslexia occurs. We, know and we are now understand ADHD. We understand how that happens. We know how to detect dyslexia. We know, for example, the importance of working with your hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah. You actually, if you do something with your hands, you learn it better. Yes, yes. We uh, know the importance of curiosity. This is actually fascinating. There's research that shows we learn better if we're curious. Mm -hmm. So if the teacher yes. did nothing more than make the student curious, nothing more, that's they would do a lot better sometimes than what we do deal, today, yeah. right? Because the, it, they can light their own fire under their own butt to go learn, yeah, keep yeah, learning yeah, down yeah. line. Curiosity releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. And just as hunger releases saliva, curiosity releases dopamine. Very cool. And once the, that circuit is activated, you learn better. So it's actually fascinating. And this is very human. Any parent knows some of this stuff. And it's yeah, sort of con yeah. con you know, confirming that. We also know, for example, that um, you can only learn for about five or 10 minutes before your brain sort of fills up. And then you should do it, use it. Oh, interesting. And, but all our lectures are an hour. Whoa. Right. Okay, so it's a kind of piece of learning and then hands-on and then maybe piece yeah, of learning. Yeah, piece of learning and then actually hands-on or test the person. Test the person, yeah, to retain. To reta re bruise retention score. The testing effect, lots written about it. Interesting. That's why all edX courses, most edX courses, we try and make our videos, MITx courses, 10 minutes. Hmm. So, interesting, because these, these interviews are long form, so it could be potentially interesting to occasionally pause. Uh, or take notes while you're going through it and then try and review what you're learning yeah. um, throughout the conversations. Yeah. Um, have conversations with other people about what you've been learning. That's why we talk about the community below in the comment section and um, on the public telegram that we have going. By the way, one of the advantages yeah. of online is you can pause. You can't you pause can a live lecture. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Imagine if you could just pause the live lecture. You can't do that. Yes, yes. Which th this is kind of what this is, is pausing you as, you need, as we need. That's right, um, when you're watching the content, totally. Um, I it was also just, I was myself starting to uh, salivate at the, at the beauty of, of, of what it feels like to, to, to seed that curiosity in new minds into the world. 
Uh, that's uh, you can see it in the eyes of the curious ones. And yeah. uh, I hope you see that at MIT. In MIT, yes. I feel like you can smell and feel the curiosity. Totally. Everywhere. It totally. sort of sizzles with curiosity. Yeah, this Cambridge area is, yeah. it's like the East Coast Silicon Valley. That's definitely yeah. how it feels like. Yeah. If you think of Silicon Valley as the West Coast Cambridge. <laughs> 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 I'm a Berkeley graduate, so I can I say love that. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's good. I'll, I'll go back and tell them when I get back is that we're the West Coast Cambridge. That's how, yeah. <laughs> Okay, tell us about what you're seeing, because you mentioned this earlier, I think it's super important to address this. Um, automations permeating into every single industry, artificial intelligence is, um, Internet of Things is. So what's going on with the future of human capital? What is it important for us to pass along to children that are being born into the world now? Like where should they be focused their attention? Where should parents be um, helping kids fo focus their attention on? You know the old song, whatever you can do, I can do better. My version of, or my, not mine, it's a well-known nerdy version of that, is whatever you can do, I can do meta. Okay, cool. So I think what we need to do is teach our children to become learning machines yeah, because yeah. they will learn for the rest of their lives. I hope we're already teaching our children, for example, to exercise and stay fit for the rest of their lives. Yeah, yeah. Don't smoke, right? Yeah. A similar yeah. habit is the equivalent to exercise is learn. Yeah. You will always learn, you will always need to learn. It's fun, keeps you engaged. Yeah. It'll delay old age, but yeah. more importantly, you will be uh, alive and employed and more prosperous if you learn all the time. If there's one thing I would say, it is teach them the importance of learning and how to learn. That's, that's really profound. And you're so right. And if we if we dig at different areas around the edge of knowledge and get that those multidisciplinary connections around how the world works, we will stay employed longer. People will yeah. want to surround themselves with us because they'll see the way that we meta. We have an abstract perspective on how things work in the world. And also if we can dig into the nuance of how things work as well. But learning wow. defined broadly, which is not just listening, but doing, you know? But doing. Doing, yes, so I mean, yes. it's everything. You have to have a growth mindset where you're learning, you're improving, you're growing in some direction, but you're constantly at it. That's gotta be our fixation. I love it, I love it. That's such a good piece of advice. Um, and then, and then give me, give me your one principle for that lifelong learning? What is that as people know, okay, I should go towards healthier eating, I should go away from smoking, I should go towards exercising. What would be the go towards learning? Where would you do it? Uh, remember the Dos Ekis uh, ad, the most interesting man in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. Remember that guy? Yeah. He has a line, he says, stay curious, my friend. Yeah. That's a very profound line. Stay curious, yes. my friend. If, you, if we can kindle curiosity, make it a state of being, hopefully somewhat directed towards where it'll help you with life, but just generally, you, because you can't control it, mm -hmm. that would be my first, and that's the most important principle. And again, we make that conscious choice, to not only to seed that curiosity in the youth, but then to also help make sure we don't build distractive systems that yeah. take them away from curiosity, but that rather inspire that curiosity with that sort of a potentially an artificial intelligence that walks, helps you, f oh, you're interested in these fields. Here's all these interesting online courses and hands-on yeah. experiences that you can explore in that field for the next couple of months and yeah things like you know if you look at our economy one of my an, an MIT student told me we are heading to an economy that is sort of uh, an attentional economy where yes like clickbait it it's is. trying to attract your attention and then you can read more about some you know Hollywood couple and their antics so we're if we can point our attention if curiosity will claim our attention but healthy curiosity as opposed to clickbait which is sort of unhealthy curiosity that's going to be our battle. It's the same as junk food versus eating good food, right? It's, this is our battle in the 21st century. Very cool. There's, there's junk food for the attention, and yeah. then there's healthy food for the yeah. attention. Yeah. That's we need to have intention idea. to point the attention in the right place. And they will, the systems, you know, whether it's an ad on a website or some clickbait, as I said, or yeah. it's all about grabbing your attention. Stay curious, my friends.
<laughs> Say it in a good way. I love it. I love it. And um, and and do a good job at at parsing uh, all of the information that is arising because you can find signal. Sometimes 80% of what you need to know is in just 20% of what's available, that Pareto principle. And so if you can really right. find that 20% um, and not stay away from the other distractive information. Okay, couple quick thoughts on the way out. Um, okay, what would you say, because you've now passed along staying curious to other people, having their attention to the healthy attention for themselves. What about for you? What has been a core driving principle in your own development through your life? I think it's curiosity, actually. Yeah. I didn't, couldn't articulate it earlier, right? Uh, I think it's curiosity. It's, um, and you know, in this day and age, you know, we have all sorts of expressions inhibiting curiosity, right? We tell kids, curiosity kill the cat, right? All good things come to those who wait because we couldn't deal with curiosity. The curious kid became ir irritant. Right? But now the curious kid's going to win. There's a you know there's a term in the Bible, right? The meek shall inherit the earth. Sort of my version of that is the geek shall inherit the, the earth. Right? <laughs> so curious kids, I think looking back, I was just curious, and a lot of my the people I hang out with, my friends, all curious, and I enjoy our shared curiosity. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> And it can even be as simple as becoming a good question asker. Yes amongst other people when you are passing time is ask thought-provoking questions. Probe yeah. reality with thought-provoking questions. Yeah. Okay. And, and once you get knowledge, integrate it and apply it. Integrate Connect the dots. Yeah. That, that's the second thing you need to do. And then third is apply it. Yeah. Don't just be a passive consumer. Do something with it. Yes. Yes. Sanjay, so good. Okay. Um, would, this wouldn't be simulation if we didn't ask you. Do you think this is a simulation? Do you think this is a simulation? You know, sort of, have you, if you've seen the movie Matrix, huh? it's based actually on one version of Hindu mythology. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Strange, strangely enough. Okay. Yeah. And or Hindu philosophy, actually. Is this a simulation? I don't think we'll ever know. What is the Hindu um Well, I mean, the basic idea, philosophy. you know, is it's the Maya. You know, I don't know if you're really here. Uh-huh. Right? And that question is asked, and yeah. the Matrix picks up on that. Yeah, yeah. So is it a simulation? I'm not sure. It could be, but hey, I'm enjoying it. So this is uh, keeping keep in it. <laughs> this is several thousand years then old. This is not a yeah, yeah, uh, very yeah. whoa, yeah. cool. Yeah, so it's, it's so called Maya. They call it Maya, which means magic. Maya. It's because someone has commented before. Oh, that's that's such a recent phenomenon. People talking about this. That's cool that um, Maya has been around that long. Okay, um, and last question that we like to ask our guests is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, I think it's uh, human beings. It's nature, actually, and human beings being, uh, of course, we might be destroying nature, but uh, being an outcrop of nature. I think that our existence is natural, and there's something tremendous about uh, nature and human beings. You know, I think that is what it is. And if it's a simulation, as I said, keep in it, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Sanjay's done the the leveling up and and, ma and maxing out of his uh, open learning attributes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. His <laughs> auto ID <laughs> attributes. Yeah. That's right. And what's what's next? <laughs> exactly. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep uh, keep leveling up, everyone. Keep yeah. leveling up. Sanjay, pleasure. Pleasure. Thank thanks you so nice. much thanks for coming much. on to the show. Thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And, and thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear from you in the comments below. Go and check out the links below to, um, to edX.org and also to the MIT Open Courseware. And go and build the future. As we talked about, stay curious. Also, go and build. Get your hands on. Go and play. Uh, find that healthy food. Go and find that healthy food and uh, support us so we can continue going to great locations like this and having these powerful conversations and sharing them with you. Much love to you all. Go and build the future. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Peace.